is the last and final day of our six day all india level faculty development program on a boot camp on ai ml and ai chatbots organized by department of it and cs of kc college in association with the university department of it let us do a quick recap of the last five days we started with tesla demonstration pondered upon how ai was used in defense ai used in business analytics e commerce establishment medical field and then finally ai chatbots today we will be the today will be the final converging session of all these days and for that we have an eminent speaker with us today mr ajit joshi mr joshi is the partner manager at red hat isv he has been an engineer from vjti mumbai and has an experience of over two decades in indian it industry he has been working with red hat india for past 3 years and manages business relationship with independent software vendors iot and embedded ecosystem partners in the past he has been the secretary of computer society of india mumbai chapter he is a regular speaker at tech meets events and is also a guest faculty at b schools his subjects of interest are ai for managers in cities blockchain digital security crm digital marketing mis and many more mr joshi is also a community event organizer technology evangelist and a tech blogger we are very glad to have you sir here thank you so much for accepting our invitation thank you i welcome you on behalf of kc college and udit of mumbai university all of us are looking forward for your session welcome once more sir and now over to you sir thank you sandhya ma'am thank you rakhi ma'am thank you neha ma'am uh, it's a privilege to be speaking uh, uh, to all of with all of you and uh, probably it's a last uh, uh, topic in the whole six day event so it would be challenging as well to keep you engaged with my presentation uh, to give you some background of uh, uh, can i go to the presentation please next slide please monish narin sir can we have sir's presentation please monish ma'am this is the presentation which ah. i have got yeah next so, next slide next slide no problem so i will take control uh, till that time he sets it up if there is a problem i will uh, ask him to uh, yes. can i go to next slide sir yes next slide please so this one my presentation is not in square format so it's okay, okay. okay. I, you can just check it meanwhile if it comes then you tell me okay. till that time i'll start from my piece yes yes sure monish it is not visible ppt is not seen by the participants and including myself no now now i think no, uh, no. yes now, now joshi some. sir is yes now we would have stopped so let me just yes yes yeah. sir now it came yeah, yeah no problem so thank you again and uh, uh, monish if it come if you see the ppt the whole ppt then again you can take it over because my internet may start uh, uh, becoming okay, no wait because of this if i do simultaneously but that's okay so so very briefly uh, what am i going to cover so i am trying to cover what is the value of artificial intelligence in the whole digital era uh, uh, these there are what are these what are the top con consideration for building a production uh, ready ai ml environment what is the business value out of it and things like that so uh, who am i i think i have been introduced so i am just skipping to the slide uh, sort of uh, i am trying to discuss at very high level in the first part of the presentation what is happening in the, the world around us uh, what are we trying to achieve in this world and uh, and sort of top down kind of a approach where ai ml uh, is being used uh, we all know what situation we are i'm sure uh, we are all worried about our future 
what kind of uh, uh, what kind of situation uh, will happen we we would be uh, wondering all of us right uh, one of the reason why this uh, conference is happening online because of uh, the current pandemic and and uh, we are we are we are all all worried about it how does ai fit into all of this situation is very very interesting suddenly what has happened is uh, all all these organizations who are big or small they are trying to maintain social distancing they are trying to get people work together and uh, and and yet everybody wants to be remote wants to be at home and try to behave together so how does ai come into all these pictures so for example uh, we have a company in bombay called senseworth uh, we have a french company called clavi they have, they have created a chatbot uh, this chatbot would help do two three things one is if the if the public utilities or government wants wants to send certain messages these chatbots are able to send messages related to healthcare uh, clarify doubts of uh, um um public who is you know getting affected by covid the second thing which they are doing is they are they, these chatbots are creating i mean i i've been able to find only two of them but there would be plenty i'm sure uh, they are able to find out uh, at who is at risk with the with the disease and and sort of able to help people who have some specific doubts and still if those doubts don't get answered then there is it then it gets sort of uh, pushed to uh, the doctor or the healthcare worker who is behind uh, for example in mumbai in every ward we have six doctors manning the helpline number uh, but even then the phone number sometimes don't get uh, accessed and there is lot of pressure on these people so what if we have a chatbot which is able to answer some of the routine questions like like how many uh, hospitals are there in the ward how many people are people uh, are ad, uh, ill and how many are uh, have relieved what uh, what wards or how many beds are there in the ward or in the icu and some of these questions if you are able to able to uh, provide it in real time it will be very much uh, uh, very much helpful and this is all real life example happened over last 2 3 months so it is not 3 months rather 1 to 2 months uh this is not something theoretical which i am talking about uh, if anybody is interested in my contact details there is my twitter handle you could tweet me and i would i would revert back to you with who are these companies and what are they doing we also have a unique situation where uh, uh, we have a company called uh, video netics in calcutta they are a video uh, uh, i mean they they manage the cctv software uh, the ip uh, surveillance camera software they have created a solution to manage social distancing so uh, imagine a situation you are walking through a corridor of a office or a hotel or 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 anywhere else and cameras are tracking your movement uh, if there is lack of social distancing the video analytics software will immediately uh, understand that there is lack of social an analytics and it could pass an alert the alert can go uh, as a voice or uh, it can repeat a message to do social distancing plus it can tell the security that there are more people than required and and this is all again uh, technology built in india uh, this company is incidentally based in kolkata and trying to create uh, video analytics software which is self learning so 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 for example uh, uh, they were they are trying to test that how do they find out uh, whether people are having distance or not uh, in a five star hotel in mumbai who uh, who that that process is under being test so i have been told not to reveal the name till the time that that process is done we have a company a company who is actually designing a robotic software where the robots can deliver uh, room service so if somebody is unwell uh, he is into quarantine in a hotel room or 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 even if he is healthy and the hotel doesn't know whether he is healthy or not uh, there is always a danger that why are room service staff uh, the disease can spread from here to here can we can we create a robot who can just go and deliver as per the requirements and and this all uh, methodology uh, is all uh, domestically companies are being developing and and it is being tested so so while we are discussing the pandemic i have told you three use, use cases just to summarize first use cases was chatbot to service people from healthcare perspective second was video analytics software to determine whether there is social distancing or not and to alert if there is there is lack of social distancing the alert would be in terms of some kind of a 
uh, some kind of a, a, a voice signal or even alert to the security or some kind of reporting to check out that who has done uh, the, this this lack of uh, lack of social distancing. There is also provision that if somebody is doing a la so lack of social distancing, the camera can uh, freeze that image and send that image to somebody at back office to check it out. And the third use case, which I said was in a hotel or any kind of hospitality, instead of uh, uh, human beings doing room service, you can have now chatbots delivering, I mean, I mean, robots delivering some of the essential material. Apart from that, uh, uh, there are agri tech startups who are uh, who are offering a lot of crop monitoring technology uh, and, and and if i get into it uh, there are there are a lot of use cases being identified do especially during covid times so for example if you have a tractor uh, and that tractor is is can can be followed by a drone uh, the drone will check out which part of the field needs insecticides or which part of the field needs water or which part of the field needs uh, uh, some kind of fertilizer from physical inspection. And then you could decide whether that part of the field needs uh, that uh, nourishment or not. This is currently prevalent in North America. And uh, my employer has, has written a paper as well. Uh, if somebody is interested, again, you can put in the chat and I will share that those uh, uh, are open source in agriculture uh, to you via, via, via the organizers of this event. So such a lot of these uh, initiatives are being taken, all being powered uh, by, by artificial intelligence in one way or other. The last one is deep learning. So, so specifically deep learning was used by the last uh, method. Uh, this, is, uh, this looks like uh, futuristic, but this is 2016 image. So four years back in Belgium, robots had started taking care of patients. Imagine we are all as a race, we are aging. We are, we are having now more older people than any time we had uh, before in our, our, our lifetime. Just imagine when India became free, the life expectancy of Indians was like 50, 52 years. Today that has easily moved to 70. And, and, and amongst the affluent people, uh, once you are healthy and, and you, 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 are, you are born, there is a good chance that a baby born today may survive up to 85, 90 years who will take care of that uh, elderly population. And a lot of such experiments are happening using robots as health attendants to patients. Uh, this image is, uh, is taken in a Belgian hospital in 2006. I have given a link to uh, the article where it is, it is being made. Uh, this robot does a lot of other things like if there is a juvenile or, or, a, or, a, or a teenager kind of a patient, this robot can come and sit with that patient and play some games with him. Uh, uh, just take some basic commands and, 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 and do the work. So first example was COVID specific. This is generally healthcare specific. And again, not something which is like into labs or into testing. This is a real life situation. This is a hospital in Belgium. The child is newly born and the robot is doing shake hand with that baby and giving that baby comfort. Uh, Brooking is a very well-known, uh, uh, well-known uh, group, uh, think tank based out of uh, Washington DC. They have outposts all across the world. In fact, in India also they have office. They keep on doing a lot of research, uh, and uh, uh, one of one of their research says is that whoever leads in artificial intelligence in by 2030, next say 10 years, will rule the world for another 100 years. Now, in this report, uh, apart from this report, there is also a fortune, uh, I think, fortune, or I'm not very, I'm not remembering the article, uh, where uh, uh, Vladimir Putin says that if you are not successful in AI, you will lose, Russia will lose as a country. And uh, I will just take uh, two, three more minutes and give a context of where I'm coming from. And, and you will understand that what, what I'm writing it here. So before, uh, say, uh, 1500 or 1600 years, India and China were the biggest GDP generators in India, in the world. Uh, um, most of the food was being created in India because we were agriculture economy. Uh, most of the uh, cotton was being created in India. So most of the clothes were being uh, made on handlooms in India. 
so so prior to 500 years back we are the world leader in economy today what maybe a us ha or china has the standing india as a country had it 500 years back somewhere around 1500 uh, uh, and and later on era uh, steam engine got invented in in europe so steam engine got invented in uk and steam engine started getting used for various applications like one was obviously they started making mills so uh, weaving cotton became very very cheaper uh, in their factories uh, uh, they started using steam engines to pull coal from the mines so coal now started getting mined in england very very rapidly and england started creating uh, coal and steel using the steam engines at a much faster rate than anybody else uh, they could also mechanize their ships and and one discovery of steam engine practically uh, made uh, the european countries invisible they control all the seas with the seas they control uh, most of the trade in the world and then they started ruling large countries like india just imagine if anybody who has been in london uh, or or uk the country ends one kilometer 100 kilometers and other side 100 kilometers the whole country is not more than 200 kilometers that could rule a large country like india uh, not on their army but really from the profit which they got from their trade and they could they could win the trade because of the technological know how which they had because of the industrial revolution which started with steam engine similarly uh, uh, if you look at it today the fear is that uh, ai will will power lot of uh, such intelligent machines uh, we have all seen so many so many stories and so many photos of uh, of things like uh, uh, the robots inv uh, invading human race and becoming very very intelligent and and so on and so forth but forget about that use case where you know the robots start uh, uh, ruling uh, human beings it is generally uh, uh, a very very difficult situation if 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 some other country has a tactical advantage using using artificial intelligence uh, this could this could manifest in lot of ways so so directly uh, their satellite communication would become more intelligent uh, their arm systems would become more intelligent arm systems would be more targeted but but many people say that the third war world war would happen on cyber security you could you could use ai to make uh, your your infrastructure very very strong against the enemy from cyber security point of view and you could use the ai in other way as well so you could automate some of your offensive strategy uh, uh, for for uh, bringing down your enemies uh, it infrastructure their 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 whatever uh, it assets they have got or or lot of other things i'm not i'm just uh, resting this this case study now otherwise i can go on and on and and give you all the kind of case studies where cyber security has bought uh, the iranian uh, nuclear power plant down and and things like that but essentially this this brooking is 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 speculating that any country and and they and they and and they have for reason they have shown photo of chinese uh, two chinese people on the on the on on the cover story is mainly because they are saying that that ai if anybody is winning ai they will be able to create uh, more intelligent factories they will be able to create uh, more in uh, more intelligent warfare mechanism uh, they will be able to create uh, a overall industry setup will will become sort of invincible and uh, and it will be very very difficult to uh, beat them in the world uh, other thing uh, which uh, uh, which i mentioned about vladimir putin that he said that if you don't uh, in invest into ai uh, you will you will you will lose out and and uh, typically he was he was not only talking about himself as russia but he was talking of entire europe so entire europe is sort of uh, suspicious of what google does or what what amazon does and and he was generally telling that uh, uh, be very careful uh, otherwise we will be in trouble um, so i will take two more minutes but but technology adoption if you really see the whole technology adoption 200 years back there was hardly anything there were no cars there were no say electricity in, in your home uh, there was uh, people would would use horse carriage or or would use bell gadi to travel and and whatever changes have happened have happened in last 200 years 
but the way uh, technology is changing for last maybe last 10 years and the coming 10 years it would be much 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 faster than what changes have happened over last 200 years and and uh, similarly a uh, couple of things are happening a lot of data is getting generated which was never getting generated earlier this data can now be analyzed uh, using uh, data analytic techniques which you would have learned about how to train a model and things like that you could create more intelligent systems and those intelligent systems will will help a country succeed in their efforts uh, with this we come to a diagram by world economic forum again this is a slightly uh, aged uh, uh, aging kind of a, a, a report but typically what happens is world economic forum we know happens in davos uh, and uh, and and there uh, we have lot of uh, these people uh, a lot of these uh, people who come from all across the world uh, they come government representatives are there they sort of uh, ideate lot of lot of things uh, about the direction sort of world economy has to take uh, uh, things which get accepted in the forum normally get a lot of investments coming in those investments mean that new products will get created if it is factories then no factories will get created so on and so forth i have given the link to that report that report itself is very very interesting uh, if you are interested to going uh, through the report you could click the link and it will take you there uh it talks about a uh, lot of stuff i have just taken one slide uh i am i am i i'm sure you are finding it difficult to read the diagram but 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 basically what is it talking it is talking about what all aspect of financial uh, services will get affected by ai so for example deposits and lending we already have uh, so many uh, wonderful methods of uh, say scoring the lender so traditionally lenders are are scored using by say fico score in us or india you have the civil score and and things like that but still there is large amount of people who are outside this uh, this credit scoring they may they may not have credit card so they 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 might have never you know applied for a credit card and they would be out, outside this system of credit scoring now how do you uh, score such people and give them credit so some of the some of the learnings there are there are startups in india called block city they have made a made a tool where just by checking your social profile you can get a idea of who are the contacts of this person and what is what would be the credit worthiness uh, there are there are e-commerce stores who are checking your buying and paying behavior and on the basis of that deciding whether you could be lended money or not uh so and, and then that that model is such that you make it once and it keeps on learning by itself if it sees for a certain parameter of people uh there are bad debts happening then it would uh, sort of uh, it it would sort of uh, lower the credit rating for all similar people and things like that so a lot of work is happening in the lending on the deposits uh, uh, there is there is lot of talk however uh, the action is yet to do but with open banking and and some of you would have heard open banking uh, open banking you will have rbi is in fact in india created what is known as a account aggregator framework so even your deposits now which are generating very very small returns uh, these fintechs who are known as account aggregators can start offering you advice which will manage your risk profile and which will uh, which will manage uh, which will balance your return expectations and sort of provide you investment products of the same grade so from if you are investing in a bank maybe it will recommend you investment in bank if the bank deposit comes with 5 lakh insurance cover it will not recommend more than 5 lakh deposit anywhere and it will and, and that engines and, and and there are three uh, or three uh, account uh, such such people who provide uh, account aggregation services in india now with license of rbi i have tested one of their uh, engine and that engine is completely ai ready uh, we have insurance so insurance is also getting more and more automated uh, more people are coming into insurance there is a company in uh, uh, bangalore again we have provided a solution to them called excite uh, life they are using machine learning to check whether a policy holder will renew the policy or not so they sell lot of small value policies and they cannot uh, really chase people for those small value pal policies 
they use a tool called h2o.ai i don't know whether you have covered it during your your uh, session uh, for last five days but h2o.ai is a tool that tool uh, uh, works on our platform and tells the insurance company that this policy holder would renew and this policy holder would not renew and they tend to uh, uh, whichever are unlikely to renew they try to just send them emails and text messages and the others who are likely to renew they put uh, their telephonic efforts or, or or they put efforts to renew them and meanwhile uh, the people who are unlikely to renew if they start responding to emails and all that they come into category where they would they are likely to renew and and then 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 that is how the marketing pipeline works there which is completely powered by ai and i told you the software h2o.ai apart from that in payments there is a whole revolution happening uh, uh, some of us who are in our uh, late 40s early 50s would remember going to a bank signing a check waiting in the queue getting payments out today with upi we are able to do a transaction in less than 1 minute while talking to you uh, my driver had gone to collect his vehicle from the guy i i moved the money using uh, google pay while i am talking to you i moved the money using google pay and and the money has got transferred so payments have come a long way now now how, where does ai come into payments ai comes into payments is Uh, with this with this fast and real time payments where money is moving from one bank account to other bank account unlike earlier days where the money would move to rbi rbi would check the transaction and then then move the pay payment back to you the next day today when account account to account payments are happening how do you check whether a transaction is fraud or not how do you check a transaction is valid or not and you have a 300 millisecond window to check it out Uh, you have to check it in 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 less than one third of a second uh, whether the transaction is fraud or the transaction is genuine. Obviously, uh, you start with some rules, then you get some complaints. You learn from those complaints, and that model keeps on developing. So we have in India companies like Customer XPS uh, who have developed the engine using AI to take care of such frauds to decide whether something is fraud or some transaction is genuine. and and if you really study all these you will understand in payments what is a revolution happening from artificial intelligence perspective coming to investment management uh, i think all of us would have heard a robo advisory uh, there is lot of excitement amongst the startups as well as uh, the the engineers who are trying to learn ai uh, because now you could study all the data of nsc you could study all the all the all the Uh, news coming in from a uh, Reuters or or Bloomberg site. Plus, you have all kind of historic data to tell you uh, what is what is what is the trend. So, for example, people are creating such models where the computer is able to tell that in June, if this much rain is there, this stock will move this much, and that stock will move that much. So now, no, it is not only technical analysis, but but you, you the robo advisory methods. which is completely ai is 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 being deployed by using things like uh, uh, your your environmental data rain heat and so on and so forth and and, and daily the daily those uh, stocks keep on moving up and down on the basis of this robo advisory uh, investment management and capital markets the both these conditions work robo advisory works for investment management you also have open banking so open banking uh, fundamentals are now being used into open insurance as well so you have now uh, very portable kind of open insurance i'm not going into that topic uh, right time right here because it can become a one and a half hour presentation anybody interested to know about open banking open insurance i will share a slide deck i have conducted a presentation just two days back for investor community for something so i can share that slide deck and it will give you a lot of ideas about what is happening in open banking and related ecosystem so open banking neo banking and and the related fintech ecosystem and then of course the overall market infrastructure so from security point of view cyber security point of view from predicting how the market uh, uh, market in uh, market will move what is the risk uh, you are getting ai uh, being deployed there a uh, lot of points are mentioned in in that diagram given by world wide forum and a uh, world economic forum and i would i would encourage you to sort of go there check it out the report uh, it is some 
30 32 slides report and it will make very excellent uh, excellent reading uh, one caveat i wanted to tell because i gave a lot of examples i gave examples of how during covid times you have uh, all these uh, all these uh, uh, startups creating chatbots and creating video analytics software creating things like uh, how to monitor your food or or even agriculture and and this stuff I also mentioned that now healthcare can be provided by robots. And then I gave a 10-minute uh, talk on how AI is powering the financial services industry. However, you should understand that all these things do not mean that they will replace human beings. I have no reason, and typically out of hype, people, people talk about how AI will take over, how robots will take over us and all that. I don't see that happening with whatever technology advantages I'm seeing now. And, and over the next four or five years. I'm, I'm not seeing that. Uh, for example, the robo-advisory which we talk about can give you advice based on past events, but, but how uh, they could read documentation very, very fast. But sometimes events which happen in future, they always happen with, with, with less, less correlation to earlier events. And, and human beings have that, ref, uh, that, that imagination, human beings have that, power to visualize something which has not happened in a much better way than, than any kind of systems. Other challenge uh, which uh, you would have studied uh, since you did connected, since you did Tesla car experiment is, uh, we see something and, and we realize it is a fruit or it is an apple or it is a banana or an orange. Uh, if, if the camera is to study whether this is a fruit or not, it has to check pixel by pixel. So it checks the color, then it checks the texture by the brightness on every color. And then sort of pixel by pixel, it is creating a diagram together and then saying this is Apple. So a lot of things which you get from the data, they are not able to visualize. Whereas, whereas human beings are able to visualize a lot of things which computer cannot, and, and that is where we are winners. I see all these tools working with uh, human beings rather than uh, working against. Uh, talking about AI in insurance, I know a startup uh, which was founded, which had a head office in Andheri East called Ask RV. So it was a robot, that robot would advise people on what type of insurance policies to buy. So there are, there are a lot of such companies being created uh, out, of, out of the desire that uh, instead of using a website to communicate to users, can we communicate using voice? Uh, that is a belief in which a lot of these chatbots are creating. Uh, in fact, uh, the next UI UX would be voice and not a web browser. That is a vision of some of these people. Uh, I am just trying to list down what are flavors of AI we have. Uh, I will just go to the chat and check if there are any questions till that time. Just hold on. I'm seeing something in the chat. Just hold on. Deepak Sate, you can get the, uh, uh, P, uh, the, the PPT for the presentation. I have shared it and maybe uh, what I'll do is I'll share it on SlideShare so everybody can download. You don't have to email to everybody. Uh, some of you have sent me the email. I may not be able to note it, but uh, I've given my Twitter handle and you could, uh, you could write to me there. I normally, I get so many emails, so I don't want to get into emails. Uh, Tweet it to me, and that will be the fastest method of responding. Yeah. Yeah, so, so these are the only questions I am having. Uh, Monish and other tech team, are you able to spot my presentation now? Because my network is very, very weak. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm doing it, sir. So I will stop share. You can uh, spread this slide called Many Flavors. Of AI. So while uh, uh, they are uh, they are uh, they are sort of displaying it, yeah, uh, it has come now. Thanks. So uh, which are the various flavors of AI? And and now I will start the, my video so you could see my face probably and while while speaking. I I disabled the. Uh, face because I was not sure about the quality of, of my bandwidth. So I did not want my presentation and my, my video to go together. Uh, let me try it out. If the network becomes unstable, then again, I will stop the video and keep the audio alone. 
So what is machine learning? So machine learning, very, very briefly, I would call it machine learning as, uh, as a method where you are uh, sort of using statistical method, data science methods to uh, derive uh, some kind of a result out of, out of artificial intelligence. So it is a it is a special branch branch of artificial intelligence where you are using predictive analytics. You are using uh, things like uh, uh, um, you are using things like uh, statistical methods. Uh, some people use simple tools like SSPS. Some people SSPS is incidentally a very old tool, almost a twenty five year old tool, uh, which does reg uh, regression uh, to do machine learning methods. There are now uh, Excel, which has got features of machine learning. And also you have very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, big packages, which, which provide you some, some aspects of machine learning. And, and these are all, all different, different things which are being used as machine learning. Deep learning is, is essentially you are using uh, the computer vision. So you are essentially uh, treating everything like a vector. Um, uh, this deep learning is also built on what, what is known as neural networks. So neural network existed 30 years back uh, when I was in engineering college. So it is the same neural network which is now being developed. You can use uh, any image or, or any kind of a vector to determine whether, whether uh, the system is working or not. For example, I could theoretically, uh, I, I, in, in fact, initially I explained that you could take an image using drone of a field and, and with that image you could determine which part of the field requires a fertilizer or which requires some kind of insecticide or which requires uh, uh, some kind of uh, additional water or, or, or some, some anything, any other kind of a, a checkup. So that is, no, uh, that is very basic deep learning. You are also, you, there is a lot of hype about deep learning treating things like cancer. So whether a dot on your CT scan means cancer or it means something else, a machine could theoretically check it and tell you. Uh, uh, I, I always have strong views within my company and, and our company is the company who keeps on advertising these things. So, so, but then I have personal views where whatever, whatever I'm saying is my own thing. I feel that human beings will still want to go to doctor and, and get checked. But a lot of these things have started uh, uh, changing very rapidly because of COVID. So now our, uh, now, now our uh, general practitioner takes does consulting on the on video conferencing. I would never imagine 10, 15 years back he coming on video conferencing and doing diagnosis. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife is a pharmacist, so even if she would call him and ask him Ke medicine lu kya, he would sort of be he would get irritated. So, so, so imagine a situation where medical fraternity, which was very very conservative, which was not able to even uh, there is a technology to take. Uh, digital copies of CT scan, uh, they were not ready to accept that technology, saying that uh, that technology is not correct and it is fraud and all that. Because of COVID, now they are they are doing telemedicine, practicing telemedicine and so on and so forth. Computer vision, very roughly, it is the eyesight of the computer. So computer, one camera can easily see uh, a two-dimensional object, but but since you saw Tesla car demo, to, for a car to travel without driver, you will need a lot of sensors and a lot of cars. Uh, and between, uh, yeah, Priyanka, you have raised the hand. You want to unmute and speak or something challenge? I think uh, they have put the hand down. I, I saw somebody raising the hand, so I, I just uh, mentioned. Uh, so, so computer vision is essentially vision of computers would be one, one computer if you are doing things like OCR, optical character recognition, where you are, you are scanning an image and then trying to read out what is there. It can be multiple cameras and multiple screens where, where you are doing driverless vehicle and things like that. Uh, you have natural language processing. Natural language processing very roughly is how can you... Uh, understand what is being spoken into. And, and you have a lot of uh, uh, such programs coming in. Uh, Siri and all these are actually sort of natural language processing. But it is very easy to confuse these kind of programs. They understand some standard words. They keep on run, uh, learning from your language, but they can be easily confused. For example, 
there are some trick questions to be asked to Siri or Google, like how do you enjoy certain biscuit the most, say chocolate chip, chip cookies, cookies the most, and they end up giving very, very irrational reply. I don't know now if they have learned it and become better, but traditionally such questions, they get very much confused and they respond something in an erratic way. So, but then there is a lot of work happening. The other work happening there is things like uh, Google uh, Translate. So you, you can actually use a voice message, uh, get it transcribed into a, a, a language, some kind of essay kind of a language, whatever we have spoken. And then you can put into a system like IBM Watson or, or there are a lot of such uh, programs which tell you what is your sentiment. So imagine if you don't have a lot of people on the call center, or even if you have people and you want to train what people are saying, you could convert what people are talking into text, feed that text to a computer program, and the computer program will decide whether the customer while talking was positive or negative, whether the a, a person had good tendency or bad tendency, whether he's a loyal customer or a, or a customer which is suspect now unhappy or, or, or you know, sort of very angry with you. So it, it can tell a lot of such things from the pattern of the language, uh, which humans may speak very, very, very soberly, but if they use certain words with a certain frequency, there is a good chance to say that whether they are upset or they are not to the point and so on and so forth. There is a whole revolution happening around uh, robotic uh, RPA, robotic pro process automation. So you have so many uh, front-end agents these front-end agents uh, do certain amount of work, but how can we sort of get them uh, to do uh, tasks in an automatic fashion? How can we get uh, these, uh, uh, these front-end uh, uh, client service agents perform a lot of tasks in an automatic fashion? That is a big challenge, and that is being used as robotic process automation. There is whole, uh, whole science behind explainable AI. And I was in two minds whether, whether to cover it in details or not. As a standalone topic for non-technical people and technical people, it becomes a great presentation. Because when we say explainable AI, uh, we are trying to uh, explain how does an AI system decide. So, so if an AI system decides that this is, the, this is what we should be doing, this is the next action, explainable AI sort of tends to uh, uh, tell you why the computer system has decided. Uh, and that itself is a very important uh, suggestion because if the AI system tells to do something and if that decision is wrong, it can get into disaster. Uh, we were discussing just some time back that can a dot on CT scan uh, say whether it is a cancer or not? Now the system which is designed uh, to check uh, that kind of a vector will tell that this dot on the CT scan means so and so. Now, explainable AI is a methodology that if a doctor sees that diagnosis, will start up tell that I saw these four points, I saw these three points, and because of this, I have decided that this was my inference. Uh, once we have this explainable AI in space, human beings can use AI systems which are very standard, take input from those systems, use the explainable AI engine, and then make more intelligent decisions. Because now human beings not only know what is the opinion of machines, they also know why is that opinion. For example, an autom automatic robotic uh, uh, robo advisory investment firm tells us that by this stock and by conventional wisdom that company is not doing well or the management is doubtful, human beings by default would wonder that why this robo advisor is recommending this stock. And typically, if you have an explainable AI setup, the external AI will explain why the robotic advisory uh, uh, record has mentioned that this stock has to be bought, what are the reasons, and things like that. Of course, sometimes uh, explainable AI and AI may be the same thing. It might be the same system, uh, which, is, which is still OK. But typically, people don't do that because they want AI to decide very, very fast. Imagine a situation where I was telling that if somebody is not maintaining social distancing, you don't want uh, the system to check out who is not maintaining social distancing and then explain why is not maintaining social distancing well, by things like for last two seconds, they are both traveling with a distance of three meters to each other. They are looking at each other, but I don't think they, are, they did not come together into the mall. So they, they might not be family members, yet they are not maintaining social distancing. You don't want that computer system to tell you this story. At the same time, 
you may want to check uh, before taking a decision whether to ask them to leave the mall or or just give them a warning whether what why why that ai system has said that they are not doing social distancing and and arrive at arrive at a explainable ai this is this is this is very soft i'm telling you but there are things like you can program this this cctv cameras to learn and decide who can harm the mall who have criminal intentions now before taking some actions on them it would be nice to understand from the explainable ai system that what is the reason they are behaving in a particular way so so lot of such systems are there uh, i had written a paper on robotics in surgery so uh, almost almost 4 years back now if a robot is executing certain kind of surgical task using uh, using micro surgery techniques why it is doing something uh, a surgeon may who is sitting on the other side of the robot we want to do that why is this robot suggesting this thing to happen and and that comes out of a explainable ai it is a it is a very emerging part of the technology the erstwhile xerox labs which are now owned by a company called palo alto into security is doing a lot of checking on the explainable ai particularly from cyber security uh, mechanism for example if i am a website in india and somebody from china and russia are trying to access my data for no reason i have no customers in those countries now the ai will uh, will will uh, ai security uh, a security system based on ai will determine that this traffic looks doubtful it is coming from a country where we are not making customers and let us try to kill it so it will go ahead and kill that traffic but i would want to know why that traffic got killed is there any business for us out of that traffic all those uh, uh, terminologies will be explained to me by explainable ai typically it's a very important tool for business managers to decide when the ai systems give some results ai ops so ai ops is a big area so some of you would have heard about devops somebody would have heard about devsecops so operations of ai you can create and develop a ai system and and you saw so many demos uh, for last 5 6 days so it is it is very very practical now to design a ai system but how do we ensure that the ai system is installed well and is taken care of how do we ensure that the ai system is not trained in the wrong way and starts taking some wrong decision there are there are so many so many examples of ai gone bad for example uh, facebook or microsoft one of that company had created a ai chatbot uh, after some 16 hours interacting with people they started talking in a gibberish language which nobody could understand so so what was that language those chatbots created nobody knows there is another such example where the two chatbots started speaking in in an anti-semitic tone so they started talking about bad about jews which is politically absolutely unacceptable in the in in us and europe or any part of the world uh, so they started talking bad about the jews and and who could have trained them we don't know so such kind of uh, such kind of maintenance is also required of ai so you the way you have it operations or or uh, you also have now specialized uh, things of ai operations because when you say ai operations it is not just patching something or taking backup of something or upgrading something or if the system goes down opening a ticket it would it would mean something like checking whether the system is trained correctly or not uh, checking whether the results of the of the ai systems are coming correctly or not if it is a chatbot it should not be it should not be talking something which is not acceptable if it is a if it is a if it is a system which is aiding surgeons or aiding some kind of mission critical loads like 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 uh, oil exploration you want to be very sure that it is 100% accurate and and uh, and 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 uh, giving correct results this is a large area of of work uh, the way you have system admins today you will have ai admins and and that will be a large job generator in coming time uh some of the jobs like advanced machine learning algorithms and all that are very high tech savvy but some of the jobs like uh, rpa or like ai ops or even some part of nlp may not be so much tech heavy uh, but at the same time there would be large amount of employment generation happening out of this uh with this uh uh i have completed my 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 first part of my presentation uh, 
Next slide, please. Uh, I will take two minute break. I will check if anybody has any questions. I will have a glass of water. And after that, we can start. If you have any specific questions about this present, this part of the presentation, I'm very happy to take it. I am also going through the chat. Just give me two minutes. Yeah, so I'm not seeing any questions on the chat. Just give me one minute and, and I will proceed. I will cover another half an hour of presentation, then I'll take a bio break for five minutes and then we could proceed ahead. So what is the value out of this whole thing like AI, right? So if you see my, my presentation, my presentation talks about value in the digital era and, and uh, and we discuss what is what is what is the era, what is happening around us, what is the top-down uh, activity out of digital. We also discuss that digital is being sort of forced on us because of the COVID uh, pandemic. I'm I'm a sort of member of sales team, and earlier I would I would travel all across the country. Almost every week I would take one flight. Uh, today I don't travel. I'm always at my home, but I spend more time on video conferencing than I have ever had. Uh, it, 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 it sounds very stupid, but from morning, almost 9, 9.30 till sometimes till midnight, I'm talking to the PC on, mid, on video conferencing software. So a lot of physical processes are being transferred into digital processes. Uh, I opened a bank account uh, in Azure C Bank without going the branch. I opened a fixed deposit account with some other bank without going to a branch. Uh, my my mother-in-law could close her uh, uh, share uh, a, a trading account without going to a branch. So a lot of action which earlier by default we were required to go to the bank are being converted online. Uh, and, and this is how the transformation is happening very, very fast. In, in US, for example, they have said that for getting married, you need not come to the registrar office. On the internet, you can send your request. Uh, the concern officer would, would sort of uh, check your credentials and then and then get you registered as a husband and wife, which earlier had to go to their office and sign in front of them with, with four witnesses. So things are happening very rapidly and changing very fast. And that digital transformation is getting thrusted on us. Usually when, when I would do this, this kind of a presentation, I would talk about digital transformation. I would say what will be the value addition for corporates and, and, and countries' economy out of digital transformation. That is no more the case that is happening. But how will AI add to value to all of us in this era is what I will, I will sort of cover in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So uh, when I was, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, when I was thinking, since it is a college crowd, most of your students uh, must be now wondering where they will get jobs what kind of jobs they will get and so on and so forth. And that would be key, uh, that would be very important for your students at least uh, from their future point of view. So I, I yesterday, I, uh, next slide please. So yesterday I sort of went to the Nokri site uh, and, uh, and, and checked with them uh, uh, what, is, what is happening, uh, uh, what kind of jobs are available for AI and I got result. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, if you see these results, uh, uh, which are being displayed here, uh, very clearly uh, you're seeing this, I search actually AIML jobs. So the first job came is DevOps automation. So while they're looking at skill sets where you know uh, uh, AIML, they're also looking at automation skill set they are looking at DevOps skill set. Uh, the next job is, of course, for a senior person. But apart from AI, they want somebody who can handle cloud and handle IT infrastructure. Uh, mainly because uh, when you are talking about AI, that AI has to be trained. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sure you could have gone the classical model of AI has got three parts. You have an input part, 
then you have a more, more uh, a, what is known as a model or an algorithm and then you have an output that output would uh, would get displayed in a particular way so you have data visualization and all that so you have these three parts into it but all these three parts to train you need a lot of data so you need a lot of data uh, management uh, capabilities i'm not sure but but there is a whole science behind data uh, so standard rdbms cannot handle this large data so now you have no sql databases in no sql databases you have you have things like uh, uh, document databases or you have got i mean there are there are different type of no sql databases i will just rest that here but essentially with so much data being available to train the ai system or ai model you need a data center and a cloud uh, as a important skill uh, then the other thing is for us healthcare they want ai people trained in python so python becomes an important skill set for somebody to learn ai and ml so really python and r are two software languages which are very important r also does a very good analytics python has a lot of functions and it becomes an important language uh, then we have uh, i will just go fast there there is a data analyst kind of a position with ai there is a, a sql uh, developer position so somebody who can manage databases and fire queries then there is a ai ml a software engineer who is also a google cloud provider so somebody who is trained on google cloud that kind of a engineer and then there is a opening for ai engineer which in the skill set says that they should know design development they should know software engineering and all that uh, this shows that uh, you can go to the next slide this shows that clearly that uh, there are no pure play ai jobs uh, it is really ai plus something that plus something can be good knowledge of python can be knowledge of cloud can be knowledge of data center can be knowledge of devops can be knowledge of uh, things like google cloud and, and and i didn't paste it here but there was there was requirement of ai ml on azure cloud and ai ml on aws cloud as well so so these were some of the jobs and and this tell you what kind of profile the industry is looking at and and that would become sort of direction to guide your students what they should be learning besides learning programming so programming is the most important thing developer jobs are evergreen jobs but but apart from that these all things they should be learning next slide please so why should students be learning ai and then obviously better career opportunities directly as ai ml engineers that is that is uh, reason number 1 reason number 2 is there are lack of skills in this field still so there is a deficit in number of engineers there are rising opportunities in this field so today there might be uh, 100 vacancies i am sure in next one year there will be 150 vacancies so opportunities are also increasing so students should learn it gets linked to data science so this is not limited to only computer programmers even some of your people who are doing bsc and msc with statistics they can look at as a, a career option because when i say a um, machine learning essentially it is all linked to data science and somebody who understands statistics uh, they would be in a better position to work with a programmer to arrive at a model which gives which throws into interesting outputs using machine learning it is also important for detecting fraud so people who are into cyber security or trying to learn things like ethical hacking they could use some of the skills of artificial intelligence to decide when there is a security threat and when there is no security threat uh there are there are people for example red hat my employer has a product called ansible that does what is known as pervasive security so you auto you you have a ai engine which tells this automation uh, piece that there is a threat and it would take counter uh, measures those measures would be shutting down the system or sometimes even spiking uh, the computer which is sort of trying to attack you so that is like sort of counter counter attack or open security so if somebody is sending unnecessary junk data at you you send junk data at that person somebody is trying to put some malware into your device you don't put a malware back because it is illegal but you still try to attack their their device in some other method this is all known as uh, offensive security you could google it later on there is there is huge revolution happening around offensive security uh, this is all coming because if somebody sends a ransomware and that ransomware is successful you cannot protect your system the only way to do is either you delete the data by formatting 
or you pay to the ransomware person the money to get your data back. So that's why some of these techniques of offensive security are being created using automation as an engine. Uh, somehow the OS which, which, which some of this offensive engine works is known as Kali Linux. It is not our goddesses Kali, but I get always amused because this is, this is absolute trivia information for you. But the operating system which manages some of the offensive security techniques is named after our goddesses Kali. So it is Kali Linux. Uh, apart from that, things like online customer support, where I discuss where, whether you know the, if somebody calls, the chatbot can uh, service the customer. The, the, the NLP engine in the online customer support can convert the voice into data and do, then do sentimental analysis, sometimes store that data where whatever is spoken and things like that. You also have uh, using AI in automobile industry, you saw, you saw a demo of Tesla. Now, most of us will not get job in Tesla. Tesla will have few people whom they will employ, but your students can get jobs in companies like Tata Motors or even uh, the Indian companies of foreigners like uh, Daimler, Chrysler uh, and, and all these. All these companies have worked with our company to create what is known as connected vehicles. So connected vehicles are not autonomous vehicles, but connected vehicles are vehicles which can tell what is the health of the car. If there is a fire, what should be the, uh, what should be the reaction from the, from the fleet owner or from the, the service agent if that car is under comprehensive service and so on and so forth. So practically every car maker has bought some software for us for their connected car initiative, uh, which is actually helping uh, to secure cars, uh, to check uh, temperature in the engines and things like that. Uh, we have even done similar project with Indian Railways where Indian Railways is using sensors to determine there are some 20 sensors. They, they talk to our software, our software then using ISRO satellite talks to a central setup of railways and keeps on pushing data. So. Uh, that is again having some flavor of AI. So it can sort of learn languages if something comes in front of its camera. It can check a lot of temperature and it has built a model that it will keep on remembering average temperature every day. And then on the same day next year, suppose temperature goes high, it will sort of alert that today is unusually high. And then if it goes beyond say 20 degrees the high temperature for that day, it will start wondering whether it is fire or not. So theoretically, even if there is no smoke, but there is fire and the temperature rises, the automobile will, uh, the, 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 the train will sort of come to understand that there is a fire somewhere or likely to fire to somewhere and a physical inception can be conducted. These are all, uh, uh, so far the railways have not connected it to the, to the train, but once they are very sure they use it for a couple of years, they would connect the system to their trains. So if, 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 the, if the local level, some computer decides that this is a fire, likely fire case, the train would come to a halt or it would trigger some other things like pouring some water or some kind of anti-fire gel on the fire and things like that. So a lot of work is happening there. Recommendation engine. This is a very, 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 very important uh, thing for e-commerce startups. So... Uh, you have uh, Flipkart or Amazon having lakhs and lakhs of product. But when you are logging into their, their site and when you are going through the site, you only see certain products. That certain products are based on your profile with them, what has been your earlier buying, and what uh, people with similar profile like you have bought. And that rendering is done over two second time. So over two seconds period, they will check what is available in their store and decide to display it to you. That is sort of a recommendation engine on a browser. There are other recommendations engine which are like offline, they are called as expert system. And you have expert systems everywhere. So you have expert system for weather, you have expert system for checking whether the automobile is good or not. And all those expert systems are actually recommendations engine, but they don't work that fast as e-commerce one. But still they give you a lot of recommendation. For example, a recommendation engine in an HR firm would, would electronically scan to the resumes and will decide which are the best resumes fit to the job description. Uh, typically, when you in India, when you advertise a job, you get thousands of resumes. Now, how do you physically check that resume? So the recommendation engine would check the resume and tell you 
that these 10 or these 20 resumes seem to be sim uh, what you're looking at and you may check it first. Once you say you've gone through it and you don't want it, will recommend next 20. So at least it is doing the matching initially with the profile which you want. And that saves a lot of time. Otherwise, believe me, if anybody has done HR work, checking thousands of resume and then deciding whom to uh, shortlist for interview is a huge task. Healthcare, we have discussed. We have discussed healthcare where robots are trying to take care of uh, people who are sick or old. We have discussed about deep learning being used for uh, reading your CT uh, uh, scans and, and things like that. Uh, it is also used in healthcare where I didn't cover, but it is being used in healthcare to uh, do the early level checking of uh, of your uh, of the uh, of of your drugs of of uh, of a, of any kind of preventive medicine. It could check, uh, and and that would be helping in healthcare. Uh, again, I would request you to Google that. Um, uh, AI in pharma research or AI in pharma molecule research, and will throw very interesting machine learning models, which will which will check the first level of pre pre animal pre clinical study. You could study molecules, how would they react, and that is all being done with AI. You also have what is known as a thousand genome project, that is again uh, being powered by AI. It is a it is a big project, and you should study it uh, if it is possible. Uh, in mobile applications, of course, AI is being used. So you have Google and Apple both using AI for their mobile phone operations. They are also using uh, these operations to check, take care of uh, uh, how would a person would browse. There are so many exercise apps nowadays where AI features are being bundled. So on the basis of what the user wants, uh, the app shows that those exercises and things like that. So a lot of work is happening even in mobile phones, uh, apart from the billing and all that, to keep you running. It is really uh, the system strength because of which during the COVID times, when their internet load has grown by five, six times, the mobile networks are still stable. They are able to give you reasonably good service. This is all happening because of advent of technology. With this, uh, it looks like I'm very, very tired. I will be taking a break for two, three minutes, having a water, taking a bio break. If anybody has questions, anything, please display. Meanwhile, you could go to the next slide, but that will become sort of a, a placeholder till the time I start my presentation, restart my presentation. We are exactly at uh, midway. We started at 3, and now it is 4.15. We are scheduled to close at 5.30. So one hour, 15 minutes are over. Any questions, happy to take it. Otherwise, I'm shutting my video and taking a break. Uh, team, please go to the next slide. Which, uh, which says our architecture consideration. So after the break, we will go through the architecture considerations. Uh, what kind of architecture is being used? What is a 12 factor for cloud? This is extremely important because all the new applications which will get rolled out are designed for the cloud. So you would have learned so many programs and so many demonstrations in the last six, four or five days where it will sit into the enterprise. We will sort of study that in our my next session. Uh, if you have any questions, as usual, please put into the uh, chat. And I'm, I'm just stepping away from my computer for two, three minutes. I'll be back in two, three minutes. Thank you.
या शैलजा मैम वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन देर इज इट इज नॉट कंपल्सरी टू लर्न ए आई स्टैटिस्टिक्स स्टूडेंट्स कैन लर्न पाइथन पाइथन इज क्वाइट इजी लैंग्वेज टू लर्न एंड दैट इज इनफ what is what is what is important to understand and a lot of people people uh, don't take it like that if you want to uh, keep uh, if you want to do uh, projects on on uh, uh, data science or machine learning and all that a lot of people think only in terms of outsourcing projects which come from us people think of these projects as somebody where where we would be working as labor for some data scientists in us and we would be working uh, for instruction given by somebody in us uh, whereas that is no more a fact now i was mentioning about a case study in excite life insurance where machine learning is used to determine whether the policy will get renewed or not and on that basis they were even not only chasing the customer from marketing point of view even pricing the policy like that if a customer is likely to renew the policy they would they would provide certain a uh, pricing advantage to that kind of customer if he's a long term customer now that decision would be taken by the actuary and the business owner it would not be taken by the it person so so how would that model be created it would be created actuary is essentially has good knowledge of statistics and uh, the business guy has some experience of business on the basis of that that model will be created and that model will be coded by a person who knows Uh, uh python or r or any other system in a great way uh, in this case uh, they were using h2o.ai and uh, for rules they were using uh, red hat uh, decision manager so it was our product that's why i know so well how did i did it although i am not sure whether i should be taking uh, names or not here because i am not authorized but 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 let us check it that some insurance company uh, wanted to create a model of ai to determine who will renew or not on the basis of which they were providing a variable service and a variable price point now till this time preparing the model deciding how to charge a customer or how to give discount to a customer rather and whether to chase the customer for renewals or not these decisions were taken by a person who is a, who is a statistician and a person who is a business manager i mean who is a sales manager who understands how insurance are sold and not by anybody else does that uh, answer your question shailaja ma'am or you wanted to speak something you could just unmute your phone and speak out yeah she has mentioned yes sir on on the chat so thank you uh, if there are no questions we could start okay so let's start so so when we are discussing enterprise architecture considerations uh, what are we uh, what are we talking about what is enterprise architecture so enterprise architecture is sort of a discipline which comes between a project manager and uh, the technology person so project manager typically uh, try to track the projects as they are going and then there are uh, people like uh, business uh, consultants or business analyst who sort of prepare a scope of projects as per the requirement of the client or as per the internal requirement so so whatever is the requirement they try to translate it business benefits into some kind of technology structure and uh, uh, project managers are the people who get projects they try to execute that projects in a particular method so they would decide how much manpower is required what softwares are required what will be the schedule of this project and they would continue with that project uh Uh, the business analyst or the system analyst or the system architect solution architect they will design the system and they will design the functionality of the system where does the enterprise architecture come into this picture enterprise architecture is a discipline where uh, uh, you 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 get into consideration of deciding how will all these it projects get related to business benefit typically the chief enterprise architect works with the ceo or cfo to explain them that what is that they will get out of this whole uh, whole whole architecture which the company is spending money many times what happens is uh, somebody decides that we have to start a crm project so 
uh, the IT manager prepares a proposal, which is like the lowest cost proposal. The marketing manager thinks that his company, let us start with CRM and then later on, if we get benefit, let us try to upgrade the infrastructure. Or if he sees his boss, who might be the head of sales or director of sales, is putting pressure to implement CRM, he tends to spend more resources and try to uh, uh, visually think by spending more money on the resources, he will be able to do it in a big way. He may even put more manpower, internal manpower, thinking that, you know, the boss will be happy that I'm allocating more resources to the CRM implementation. And, and such, such games get played in enterprises where, uh, where, where inputs are put into a direction on the basis of somebody's opinion and without understanding the holistic picture of the technology of the project side, of the benefits we have, which have to be de derived from the solution. Typically, enterprise architect is a person who gets into this kind of an environment, understand what does the user want, understands what are consideration of the project manager because he's always bold on uh, implementing the project in the fastest way with the lowest number of num lowest resources being put into so the cost is kept in control and at the same time the sponsors of the project and the stakeholders of the project get what they wanted to get out of this project uh, typically it would also mean that talking to stakeholders and defining the project a, 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 a head of sales may think that CRM is only a sales tool and would design the whole thing on the basis of sales, whereas CRM is also a customer service tool. It is also a marketing tool. So an uh, enterprise architect understands that and tries to bring these other functions. Uh, that's what I use the word holistic. Typically, uh, if you look at enterprise architecture, there are two, three ways. So there are companies like Oracle who have their own enterprise architecture practice. But the most uh, respected enterprise architecture in the industry is by a group called Open Group. Uh, Open Group has a certification called TOGAF. I, I, have, I am certified in that personally. So this group, uh, uh, which also incidentally owns the brand called Unix. So many of you would have heard about the operating system Unix. Those who are of my age might have even uh, played with it in their college in their uh, maybe 30 years back or 35 years back. Uh, Unix brand is owned by the Open Group. So Open Group runs this test, which is known as TOGAF test, and they, they have a lot of uh, forums where where our, our enterprise architectures are decided. Uh, the whole whole feature set of this enterprise architecture is that you create uh, any kind of a system which is modular, which can be repeated, and there is minimum amount of wastage and large amount of standardization. Plus, you marry it with uh, holistic uh, use of the system, and uh, all the stakeholders and 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 the sponsors of a project being taken into confidence and also the project team being taken into the confidence. So enterprise architecture is a, is, a, is, a, is a methodology which takes care of the limitations of uh, the project team, whose focus is to do very fast and at low cost, and the user department whose focus is to get his own function benefited and other function may or may not be benefited, they may not have a view. Plus the people who are paying for the project, which is the executive sponsors, the CEOs, MDs, CFOs, and all that, and also other stakeholders beside the direct users. So it is a different job than uh, IT industry has a job called product owner. Enterprise architect is not a product owner. It is really something after a product owner, but before a, a project manager in the hierarchy in terms of uh, coordinating with the customer and coordinating with internal people. I have given enough uh, discussion on this architecture. Uh, next few slides we will cover what architecture is required and very clearly, uh, the architecture required is cloud native. There is a setup which is known as 12 factors of cloud authentication. We will go through those uh, factors. Out of those 12 factors, really uh, few factors, four factors are very important. We will spend some more time on the four factors, but we will cover rest all other factors in a fast way. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, so very briefly, uh, what do we require for enterprise architecture? So how can AI offer differentiated services more quickly? Why I'm using this word more quickly is because we have defined AI as something which has got training data. It should train the model. Once the model gets trained, the AI functions in a better way. Till the time the model is not getting trained, it works like any other analytical software. Uh, so how can this AI system offer services more quickly? How do you train the data more quickly? 
or how can you do supervised learning and non supervised learning at the same site these are all consideration for ai architecture other way to look at uh, to get maximum benefit out of ai is there is so much innovation happening in small small uh, single room apartments in india where small startups are creating innovation that enterprises find it very difficult now to work with only large companies if you look at uh, 15 20 years back a uh, enterprise would take services from a large erp player like sap or if it is a bank it would go to infosys pinnacle and buy their core banking software now the most of the research in ai is happening with smaller people uh, uh, there are ai companies in mumbai which are working in the area of open banking robo advisory and things like that but if you go to places like bangalore or pune or noida gurgaon you have so much innovation happening on one road of kormangla which you cannot imagine uh, or 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 say one one road of uh, noida sector sector 18 you could not imagine so so lot of innovation is happening with small small setup the company which i said sense forth three years back did not exist today it has created a a chatbot which they are able to sell it even outside india crack covid the company which i mentioned video netics uh, that company was traditionally into traditional ccdv software the owner's son created a r&d setup and now they have created within one year a uh, few uh, new applications uh, counter ter terrorism ac application counter covid application which they have never created they were always used to selling their ccdv software like a very basic ccdv software and selling it at bulk so so lot of lot of innovation is now happening and how do i employ this innovation with me so for example i may buy sap and i would have some ai features on sap like optical character recognition or i may have some of the chatbot features on sap nowadays available or on sap crm particularly or sales for crm but i may want to buy a hr bot which is available in the market i may want to when i am reopening with with uh, my office after covid i may want to take that uh uh that analytics bot which will tell me whether in my office social distancing is happening or not happening now i cannot wait by sap or or my sales force to develop such a bot at the same time i cannot create a separate system to run this separate bot i may not want to use public cloud which i am not using to create one more security hazard into my system now how do i plan to use all these kind of disparate system which are changing so fast into into my it enterprise it system is where the enterprise architecture uh, comes in some of you might feel that it is not very cool but but please try to understand that it is very very important for enterprise it to get all the innovation in at the same time the innovation should be secure it should be manageable and you should do what it is supposed to do uh, apart from that how do i use autonomous computing in my uh, in my company so ai gives lot of insights sometimes human beings may not be able to act on those insights can i automate it and and that becomes the next challenge the fourth challenge is i have got very good engineering power i have got good it people how will it make my customers happy and that is a big big decision i want to make that it should make my customers happy so i get repeat customers i get more orders or i get more business from the same customers that is all another question why you while you are using ai you may have the best technology but if the user experience is not good that technology is not useful at all so how do i how do i do that so that user experience is good and and i would delight my customers so what are the answers to this so cloud computing may be a enabling step for ai mainly because the smaller companies who are based in single rooms i am sure they will not have money to buy server storage firewall and things like that they would be typically using the public cloud they would be typically developing on uh, aws or azure or ibm cloud or google cloud or alibaba cloud or net magic cloud or sifi cloud so you have so many clouds right so they would be developing on one of that cloud now i may want to be sure that if they have developed in one particular cloud it would work on my cloud as well i may not have all these seven eight clouds but i would want that software to work on my cloud and i would ask them that you are on uh, on azure but i am using ibm cloud or i am using uh, 
uh, AWS cloud. Incidentally, Azure is Microsoft cloud. So, um, so, so I would want to, uh, I want to, I want would want to have answer of that. So, so it should be cloud ready. Then, can this AI ML automate some of my manual and slow and error prone activities? For example, can it check while I'm doing patch management, whether my patch management has happened in the correct way or not? So can it help me to do automation? Can it help me automation my service desk? So service desk and call logging is a very painful activity. I have automated my service desk, but sometimes users enter wrong information and that creates my automated uh, uh, desk to get into problem. So we have got another company called Dynatrace who has used its service desk with AI capabilities to proactively uh, check and uh, revert whether there is an error into the log, uh, into the call logged or not. So you are able to automate the service desk using AI. Apart from that, uh, how can uh, we provide better user experience, employee experience? And if you have partners which are like resellers or dealers of mine, get better experience. How can I develop applications faster? I, I want to bring newer services and products faster into market and they should be reliable. Can my AI help me? Can I leverage all these new services based on these AI technologies and get benefit out of this? So these are all likely answers for all the questions related to AI. And the answer is there should be st standardization. Uh, next slide, please. There should be standardization of my architecture. I should use my architecture in such a way that it benefits all. Since we are discussing uh, digital transformation, uh, digital transformation is when uh, my definition of digital transformation is uh, technology starts working with human beings. So earlier, you would need an agent to book your cab. So you would call a call center. The call center would book your cab, and then they would coordinate with the cab driver with your address. The cab driver would call you that, where are you lying? And the Uber cab would come to your house. Uh, whereas, whereas today with the Uber app, uh, it does two, three processes. So A, uh, the booking agent is eliminated with the app. You book the car on the app. Your location is decided by the app. You don't have to tell where you are lying. Uh, it sees your phone and decides where you are. Uh, it has got synced with the Google Maps. So from the Google Maps, it understands how to travel to your location. So it advises the driver how to travel. The driver doesn't have to call you and ask for your advice. It even accepts the payment from various payment gateways, uh, from wallets like Paytm or Google Pay. So it, it even replaces the, the, the work of giving cash and taking back cash. So so it is essentially working like an interface between various human beings, uh, replacing some of the human tasks, taking over some of the uh, equipment tasks. This is what I call it digital transformation. So when an organization says that they want to undergo digital transformation, what is it that they should be looking at? So what happens in an organization typically is 70% of their job goes into keeping the bulbs lighting. So if the IT budget is 100 rupees, 70 rupees goes in paying salaries, in taking care of uh, the, the maintenance of equipment, in giving power to the equipment, uh, putting some, uh, some additional manpower into that equipment, and so on and so forth. I'm very sure most of us have similar experiment in our house or in our, uh, in our college or even in our personal time. 70-75% of the time goes in doing routine tasks. Uh, Shailaja Rane is asking some question. I have a different answer to it. I have ans answered that earlier and I will take it up after this slide. Uh, so, so if you really see, uh, 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 there are so many, so many tasks which we do on a routine basis, even in our personal life, up to 70 to 75%. Same is true for a company's IT budget. Most of the resources go in paying ex existing manpower and things like that. 15 to 20% of the cost goes in upgrading the facility. So typically a growing company will hire more manpower. That manpower will need more software and hardware. Uh, 
or or you will upgrade some of the versions to make it them more secure and for for that you end up spending 15 to 20% of your budget so really for doing innovation you have hardly left with 8 to 10% of your budget and forget about the budget look at your personal lives uh, we are not traveling anymore so we should ideally get 2 hours free to do extra activities uh, but really if you ask us we are not getting that time because those two extra hours are being spent into doing things like uh, managing people on uh, on video talking to students on video face to face something can be explained in 5 minutes or video conferencing it takes half an hour to explain so so lot of lot of time goes in just what we call in it industry keeping the lights on just to keep uh, the infrastructure running you would end up spending 90% of your resources one is keeping the current infrastructure running paying salaries and then upgrading whatever infrastructure you have because of the growth which you are getting now how do you how do you find budget over the 8 to 10% for for driving innovation which will bring maximum benefit to your organization will give more profit will provide more customer service and all that for that we should have it optimization so you should save some part of money out of that 76% and and you should optimize whatever you are having once you optimize that suppose that 70, 70 rupees is now reduced to 65 uh, the growth on that 65 next year will be also less so you always tend to do cost cutting and try to do some it optimization as a ongoing activity if somebody says that he will not change and will maintain the it infrastructure as it is he will have no budget to put chatbots or to put automation or or to or to do any kind of uh, very very useful digital transformation he will do some processes just for tick mark but will not get anything out of it so this becomes a very important topic which is it optimization which in bracket you can say it cost control uh it is not only cost control but it is also moving away from old technology to new technology sometimes bombay stock exchange was on tandon himalayas which was later on acquired by digital and later on acquired by uh hp now this system which was known as non stop system was extremely rugged but it was extremely slow bombay stock exchange while uh, sort of did their study and found out that to upgrade the entire system they may end up spending 500 crores whereas when they tested with open systems they suddenly realized that the cost would be less than 50% of their cost and and the speed would be much much faster so in fact after changing that gear bombay stock exchange is as stable as what it was earlier and it has become the fastest stock exchange of the world so you could go on youtube and google uh stock bombay stock exchange the fastest stock exchange in the world and you will get very interesting videos if time permits now uh, in the break i will put the video in the chat and you could see it at your leisure uh, this video about how bombay stock exchange automated their system that is it optimization as a part of digital uh, 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 transformation you also require integration with external world i am sure last 4 5 days you would have learned libraries like tensorflow you would have learned about so many apis which are there in the market now you have to integrate with them very fast if you are a bank you have to integrate very rapidly with a swift if you are a if you are a company which is into retail you may want to uh, interact not only with your own stores but nowadays you have delivery companies you want to integrate with those delivery companies you may have small satellite stores in case of dmart so you may have to integrate with so many different players that's why you require agile integration while public cloud uh, infrastructure is growing your company also has a lot of data on premise a lot of systems are not really cloud ready plus because of compliance you you have to put lot of data in your enterprise that's why your cloud should be hybrid cloud it should be a cloud which works in public cloud but at the same time it, it should work on on your premise or even if you change the cloud it should work very very seamlessly the topic of discussion here is this software should be cloud native and we will discuss very fast we don't have time because because to understand the 12, 12 factors of cloud uh, development it is it is almost a 2 3 hour lecture so so very rapidly we will understand what are the 12 factors after this very fast and then of course you need automation so i am not again going into automation but to have digital transformation you should have automation the reason is if there are so many uh, projects uh, where physical processes are being replaced by it pro 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 projects you want uh, to ensure that it is automated and you don't do lot of actions manually uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. I'm answering Shailaja ma'am's question. Uh, digital transformation, many people will lose jobs. So I started working in IT industry in 1993. And uh, next slide, please. Even that time, uh, we had a uh, lot of people talking about uh, computerization will, will ensure that jobs will get lost. Uh, imagine uh, State Bank of Employee uh, and Life Insurance co com Insurance employees were wanting to go on strike because they thought that computers will lose their jobs. The reality was even in the public sector's job increase and because of computerization now on month ends and uh, quarter ends and financial year ends, they are able to come home on time. During COVID, it is proved that because of computerization with 10% or 20% people, they are able to run branches. Uh, that, is, that is all power of digital transformation. So people, uh, people will, will talk about uh, a fear of every time, but but it is all a fear of unknown, fear of things which we don't know. Over a period of time, uh, Shruti says, due to server problem, my chat boss message got deleted. You can repeat, uh, Shruti. Yeah, somebody can answer her. I'm not sure what is the chat boss message got deleted. Uh, so. So, so this is what it is, and and people are always scared about technology, and and they have doomsday prediction. In fact, uh, I have a, I have seen one uh, documentation when magazines came in 1920. Uh, they said that jobs will vanish because now people will start reading papers. There will be no no jobs for people who write uh, news bills and sort of communicate to other people on writing. And small small companies instead of sending letters will give advertisement in newspapers and magazines and that will finish the jobs of copiers. But, but, but then the reality is there is more employment today than 1920. So small jobs may vanish. I am not sure. So, so small jobs. Uh, so I have, I have actually written a paper on how blue collared labor jobs will get affected by AI. So actually, we all fear that call center jobs will get vanished or these kind of jobs will get vanished by AI. But there is a good, good chance that by automation, jobs like petrol pump agent or jobs like security, they will get vanished. If you have a very robust kind of a security, you don't need so many security jobs, uh, <coughs> security guards. Uh, most part of the world for toll nakas, you don't have manpower. Uh, tolls, toll nakas are automated. So actually, all kind of jobs will get affected and will change. But, but practically, the, the history of mankind is technology has helped mankind to do better and better rather than go back and... Uh, yeah, small jobs may vanish, ma'am. That is possible. But, 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 but overall, if more jobs get created, it is always better. And that always happens, right? It is not only because of AI. Uh, so many jobs in corporate life disappear. And uh, for example, in, when I started my career, there was a huge team of people who are known as typists. They would type data for you. All the typist jobs are now over. But still, there are more, less, less unemployment in that just graduate category now than what it was in 1990. Imagine the period of Amol Palekar movies where you, know, you would suddenly find a lot of unemployed youth on the street. That scenario has changed, at least in big cities. If you are a graduate, you get a job in big cities of some type. Anyway, this can, this can go on. We can discuss it separately once you can unmute your, your mic and we can speak at the end of it. All this innovation is happening in open source. Again, the same reason. Uh, the, the reason being that the startups and the smaller companies who are coming into the market, they may not have, they don't have the resources to buy proprietary software so they would use open source, which is a free software system. They would develop something on it. They would, they would uh, typically use it to um, um, make it as per open standards. Typically, that is very, very secure because, because people read the code. Contrary to a lot of FUD, which uh, proprietary vendors talk about, open source is actually the most secure software because there are no unknown backdoors into it. Uh, uh, during Cargill uh, War, some of our GPS system failed because there was some backdoor into it. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have such those backdoors into uh, uh, open source software because you can read the software, you can decide if there's something problem by reading the source code. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
we have now uh, roughly 40 minutes, so we'll go to the court. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we are quickly coming into the 12-factor uh, system. So the 12-factor app is actually created by a Salesforce partner. They had a platform-based system on, on the Salesforce cloud. And they found out that if you follow this 12-factor uh, 12, 12 system in preparing the apps, your, your system will work on any kind of cloud. Uh, this stems from a fact that while you, while you design a, a, a system meant for your personal server into your company, you have things like Active Directory. You have an elaborate authentication mechanism. Also, when you design a software, you have dependencies defined that for this system, you will need this software and so on and so. Whereas when you are talking about cloud, there is nobody to help you authenticate your system. It is always self-service. On the basis of self-service, you are, you are sort of getting into the system and not getting into the system. So that is how this code base is prepared. <coughs> you, you sort of use this code base and, and design the system. It would typically work on most of the cloud. This is known as also cloud native system. So cloud native app development. The first factor is code base. Typically, you want to ensure that there is consistent code available. You will have multiple programmers working on the code and you will have multiple code floating. So you want to use a version control system so that the, the deployments would, would run from that, that system onto your cloud server. So typically, if you look at GitHub uh, kind of repository, in that repository, you would have various versions of your software and you could decide from the GitHub which software would get run on your cloud system. Other method is, of course, like Git, you have private Gits. So you can have private repositories. And using those private repositories, you could install your system. So that is the first factor, very important, so that there is no change in your software happening and you don't have to do troubleshooting. You always know what are you installing on the cloud. Uh, that cloud can be within your premise, but there should be a repository of data. There should not be any external dependency. So for example, if you are creating a system, its own data should be within that system. Uh, it should have its own small database where it would store the result. And that small data would get synced to the main database and, and update the records. So no external dependencies, everything should be packaged into the system itself. This is possible only if you use containerized version of software. So one method to do is using containerization, where you have a Docker container or any kind of open container interface container, and you would install that within that container. Uh, I, would, I would sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 tell you what is a container. Container is a piece of uh, code in which all the executables are there. There is a small version of OS into it. So read, write, and authentication mechanism are there. And the software as an image would be present on that container. And it would, it would get fired on its own. So typically, if you have one, uh, if you are, say, an e-commerce player, and you have one application got called invoice, and now suddenly thousands of customers have come, you can, you can fire more and more, the, the, more of these containers with the application uh, image called invoice and do invoicing of so many people. So there are a lot of, lot of such advantages of having a, a system without any dependency. When you have uh, a dependency wise, uh, wise uh, any kind of system, it would run on your server, it could run on private cloud, it would run on public cloud, it would run on some other version of Linux, and still it would work on its own. Very important to design. You don't want to design some very fantastic AI app and tell the customer that my thing will work only on AWS, or my thing will work only on certain OS, or certain server, then you will not get market to sell your software, however good it is. Then config. So config should be stored with the environment variable. So code should remain the same, even irrespective of where the application is being deployed. So it is sort of same to uh, dependency two, where config 
and the dependency are always designed in such a way that they remain un unaltered in spite of the external variable. So again, here, this is uh, talking about containerization or serverless computing and things like that. The fourth is backing services. So you should be easily able to uh, have backup services for a particular service. So if a container gets, uh, gets corrupted due to some error in your memory or some memory on uh, error in your OS, a new container should get fired. So, so anything where you are backing, it should be restored at the fly. The application should not come down to backup it itself. It should be portable and run very fast. Factor five is build, run, and release. It just means that there should be a difference between build, there should be a difference in release, and there should be a difference in run stage. Uh, this is heading towards what we call it as the DevOps. So the developers build the system, the QA people run the system, so they test the system, check the security, and the operation system will release the system and start working with it. So you have automation of these cycles, typically under what is known as CICD, continuous innovation, continuous development. You can automate most of this task. You have a lot of DevOps tools, and you could use DevOps uh, techniques to, uh, to manage some of these cycles. These cycles also mean that I could build a, a software on my small public cloud in AWS. Uh, it would get tested by some other team who is appointed by my customer who will do the QA. And it would get released on customer's own system, which might be a large server farm or large data center. It is not dependent on where it is being built, where it is run, and where it is released. Uh, this is what is known as uh, the DevOps cycle, very important. I'd also explain to you what is known as AI ops. So if the final release is AI based, then uh, it would be I the AI operations which would take care of the release. Then we, uh, the sixth process is what is known as stateless process. So what is stateless? I'm not getting into too much uh, detail. Uh, most of you would have learned TCP IP. Uh, IP is a, uh, is a stateless. So IP is not dependent on uh, what is your protocol, uh, where it is running, and, and what is the layer of TCP IP. It, it just remembers your virtual address of IP and, and drums. And once the transaction is over, the transaction is over. So typically, IP-based processes are all, all, all stateless processes. Or the internet gets fired by HTTP protocol, and you have an have a API called REST API. So REST API would typically be stateless. If we are talking about TCP ports, then that becomes stateful. Now you are trying to understand what is the application port, whether to open it or not. And those port addresses, some of you would have learned. Uh, that, be, that, that depends now on the system administrator's will to open a particular port or not. And the application would be difficult to run in cloud if that particular port is blocked. Concurrency. Concurrency means that you have to break your application into smaller pieces rather than trying to make the applications bigger. Uh, for example, you, I, I mentioned about a single container called invoice. It would make sense to have a separate invoice application, a separate inventory application, a separate application for rendering, a separate application to check whether you want to buy or not, so create a cart. Now, these separate applications can be fired the way you require. If there are a lot of people who are just checking, I may have a cart application. If I have a lot of people buying, then I may have uh, a, a, a invoicing application. If a lot of people are going into invoicing but but doing pay on delivery then i may not have a large amount of payment application running so have this concurrent application running rather than creating a large application and all these concurrent applications have to be stateless they should work on ip and that will ensure that uh, these applications will run irrespective of each other at the same time they will fire as far as the requirement of the system the next, uh, next, next uh, thing is disposability. So processes should be less time consuming. Uh, again, it, it, it comes towards microservices architecture where, where we said that we have concurrency. So we are, we are creating smaller, smaller applications. Disposability also depends on if the application is small. If the application is small, it would get executed very fast. 
plus it would be cheaper because smaller team developer teams would develop some smaller programs and you would run fast and stop fast this is also the basis of most of the ai programs you don't find ai programs very complex there would be one task and for that task you have one program if it needs something more it would go to a tensor flow library or it would go to some other code tool it would take whatever is required from that tool but by itself it would be very small it would not be as large as a say a sap system or something like that then of course the factor 10 is developer development and production stability it is very similar to build run and release where we are saying that development staging and production it should be as similar as possible for anyone to understand and release it so while it says that you could use various languages you could use various protocol try to keep it as standardized as possible so anybody can understand it for example uh, there is a language called yaml which is widely used in operations now yaml if you read a yaml uh, any kind of a command it is almost like english it would say open and the name of the system it would say shut and the name of the system so these are the commands in yaml again whatever i am talking i am just entering it into the chat box because it is very difficult to prepare slides and then talk impromptu on those slides otherwise it would mean that i would read out of those slides which i don't want to do so i have put yaml you can do lot of research uh, we have a product called yaml there is a company called dynatrace for example they have a command called openshift.yaml so within their system if they if we type this one command that system understands where is the openshift system of red hat into their data center and it would sort of try to fire that system with one command openshift.yaml so so such fantastic kind of tools are available to do this develop and production parity and then logs so for example any kind of system if there is any changes there are logs and those logs should be stored so logs sometimes uh, you can have a architecture where you say that logs can be gated can be saved for 7 days can be saved for 10 days and all that so when you have microservices architecture which has got its own storage normally you will get lot of logs and you will try to save it for 7 days and all that because because the system never goes down if a microservices has got one error which creates a log the system still keeps on running so you want to check the logs at as per your leisure in a traditional system when the system goes down and the log is created it's a major fire fighting everybody wants to read the log whereas here the logs go don't get read so you should have a mechanism how to store the log and how to retrieve the log and the final thing is admin processes uh uh, uh, uh yeah, uh, this for example the admin processes mean that the admin should not mess with the database they should not create some one off scripts uh, uh typically uh, for example we discuss python python is a scripting language now if the admin knows python he should not be writing some programs just for the heck of it to affect the database he can create newer programs to provide newer service but let him not change anything where you require human intervention again typically admins want to show their knowledge and they end up doing lot of things on the system by writing small small programs what happens is this small programs work detrimental to overall system i am a admin i see some new ai program or algorithm floating in the market i will prepare that program now once it is provision without uh the factor 5 or with the factor 10 or with the factor uh 6 or with the factor 2 any of the factors if i don't follow and i deploy some new program that means that it may be dependent on particular environment it would it would not it, it has not been tested so it can create a security risk for me it has it has it has it, it may not be stateless so it may suddenly come down if the if the properties of change and things like that so you don't want admin overreach in such a way that it would create mess with the system the ideal architecture for a cloud is where you don't have to do much on the system like if you see facebook or google you don't have so many manpower trying to do admin work because the system is reasonably automated and it works everything from the application layer you are not trying to do anything from the infrastructure layer where you are trying to put a load balancer or trying to put a firewall or things like that i have never heard in google that somebody had to bring the system down because he has to install a firewall so that kind of architecture is not okay next slide please 
some somebody has chatted i just saw but it is not come here no problem i am i am not able to see so what is cloud native development so cloud native development is something which follows those 12 clouds uh, 12 factors of cloud which are these 12 factors these 12 factors are essentially you want you wanted to avoid discrepancy between the development and production system you wanted to keep uh, less number of dependencies you wanted to ensure that you could scale up and scale down very fast uh, by following the containerization and microservices architecture and uh, you would want the admin to be have a observatory role and not have a very very elaborate admin who would be always doing some outreach with the system and by doing all these processes you would want to keep the cost low so you don't want to increase the cost because i mentioned in the in the first discussion point that 70% cost is going into running the system i don't have much money left so if i have to innovate then i have to keep my cost extremely low otherwise it becomes very difficult to bring newer projects nowadays into it people are very very executives don't want to spend money for the heck of it unless they are sure they will get targeted returns so they are, they are they are very very of spending money to uh, to take care of it uh next slide please so this is the architecture this is i have used the open banking architecture which i had designed recently but but this is true for everybody so you have the the central framework of architecture based on three pillars you have a integration layer which you would integrate other systems so it, it becomes very flexible uh, you want to ensure that it is not very heavy so so when i meant heavy if some of you have learned what is known as the etl process so earlier you had this extraction transformation uh, business where you took some data from some layer uh, change it for your operating database and then started working the system instead of a etl process you would want streaming so you would want that system to work together instead of a etl process or you had a soa or esb process so enterprise service bus process or service oriented architecture process instead of this old processes now you want to do streaming uh, streaming is done by a technology called kafka which was created by linkedin and now uh, um, it is it is a apache product some of these names may appear to be very new to you i am putting it into the chat you could read that uh, but essentially uh, 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 originally this was uh, kafka was created by linkedin and uh, now it has become very uh, it is part of apache uh, uh, foundation used for merging the operational database and the non operational database like warehouse or some some third party data sites uh, data owners and things like that so so this becomes very important part of the architecture when you are designing a system imagine you create a chatbot which is very very intelligent it is cloud native so it is able to talk to uh, different uh, uh, libraries of google or microsoft uh, and all that but if it is communicating with the enterprise system in a very weird way where you are taking one day or few hours to do that then that chatbot is not not useful because i may do some transaction in a bank on the on the banking system my chatbot should tell me what is my balance immediately i don't want that chatbot to follow the etl process and tell me at the end of the day what is my balance i want to know the balance immediately so that is how that that distributed integration comes into picture it has to be very very agile it should be lightweight it should not wait for end of the day i want results immediately the other way to do streaming uh, without apache kafka is use uh, columnar databases so you have columnar databases like redis labs which is very again very again common so uh, redis labs or or redis is the product name you could use that and that becomes like a very fast database where all the data is on the column and and data would get changed between various systems so a lot of these strategies are being used for integration and and one can talk about it for one one and a half hour containers are very important because now you want the software to run irrespective of what is the operating system uh being used uh by your system so you want to make be sure that irrespective of whatever operating system you are having whether your servers are in your premise or you have virtual servers in the cloud 
that cloud is Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud or and Google and Foss or whatever you are not carrying. So it should be available to you and run. That is possible only if it is running in container with its own small operating system and things like that. Uh, the other change which I have not touched is the database management where I, because I am not the expert in database management systems. But, but some of the RDBMS which follows what is known as the ICE uh, framework. Essentially, nowadays you have even asynchronous databases with being there in the containers. So nowadays, a lot of changes have become in database management because of this proliferation and high velocity of data. And, and they are all suitable for the container role. So containers have, should be made now if you want to develop something in cloud. And later on, containers still will reserve some capacity of the compute. Later on, we are moving towards serverless computing or function as a service computing where nothing will be reserved for running your code and the code will run on its own on the infrastructure. So that is that is another another way to do it. Uh, you have Knative on Kubernetes who does it and you you have some other system on Apache or, uh, Apache uh, Foundation framework you could learn from them. APIs, very, very massive. So you have all kinds of APIs available. You are able to book tickets from one system because of API. You are able to book hotels from one system because of API. You are able to buy insurance from Insurance Bazaar because of APIs. So APIs are very, very important for every kind of setup and you need to use it even in AI. So you will create, so so uh, so Google would create a library or, or Microsoft has created a, a, a language library called Louis. Now that will talk to external world using API services. They, that would not talk to external world by somebody doing FTP of their software. And, and that way APIs are very, very important uh, in, in all spheres of life. Uh, the two horizontal dots show that the technologies which run with everybody. So you need a culture to manage this kind of a setup. Earlier, you would have a new software release every six months or one year where you would have a certain process to inspect the software, to test the software, and then to run it. Now, when the releases are coming after every sprint, and every sprint is of one week or two weeks, uh, now you want uh, that sprint to be managed via uh, not only the IT system, but also with the culture where you are forgiving. Uh, if the software is less uh, than what you want, still it does whatever you are supposed to, a uh, minimum supposed to be doing. You should become forgiving, ask them to do it in next cycle and things like that. So because if you are using agile methods, of course, if there is some shortcomings, within next 15 days or 40 days or 30 days, it would get changed. You are not looking at waiting for another six months or one year for a new software to come. So, so it requires a lot of cultural change in the organization as well. It helps for innovative programs like AI because now you could push programs very, very fast. And if they don't run or they are found to have some shortcomings, you could sort of again change it after the after the one sprint is over or two sprints are over. Unlike earlier days where if you had a bug in the system, you have to recall the entire software, kill the software, and then relaunch it after there is mood of the people after, after maybe six months or one year. Uh, same for processes. Processes should become agile. Tools should become agile. When I say tools should become agile, means they should not have dependencies. Typically, IT monitoring tools should not have any agents. They should run without agents if possible. And then everything needs to be automated. So this, this kind of things are sort of foundational technologies. And then you have other technologies on top of the pillars which I said. So for example, even if you have enterprise applications like ERP, core banking, uh, you have uh, business process management, all should ideally work on containers. The new technology which is coming in IoT, that, should, that your system should be ready for it. And even the data management should be done in such a way where you could share the data on APIs. You could make it very lightweight using containers. And it would also get integrated using integration to outside world. Next slide, please. Uh, while we are discussing about all these architecture. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is the particularly the integration architecture which we were discussing. What it says is uh, uh, this this slide really says is 
all the modern architecture which which include a, uh, which include architecture meant for ai has to become very agile and it should integrate with a lot of factors we are again coming to the first state of ai where we are saying we need a lot of data to train the ai system now if we need data to train a lot of ai system it is very unlikely that the enterprise will have all that data so when you are training a, a, a ai system you need to integrate with outside data systems with outside libraries and so on and so forth for example if you are creating a ai system to check a, a, a ct scan you won't have so much patient data in your hospital so you will have to get the data from somewhere with people who have the data they may not want to give the data away to you they will want to keep the data with themselves so how will you still make use of that data and make your system intelligent that is a big big question so for that you have all these apis uh, you would want to create systems which are on low code so for example uh, if you are creating a system for ai and and you are telling and i give you give you the example of excite life right where where people are deciding uh, on the ai tool what should be the response now you don't want the response to be as a computer code or as some program you want that to come as some kind of a simple form in this case the they are using excel sheet so they have a excel sheet they enter certain data on it on the basis of which uh, the systems gives them some results and they take action also on the basis of the excel sheet so rules are decided on the excel sheet they have formatted the excel sheet in such a way where those particular data points so what they would do is uh, if they want somebody to call call up this customer under certain rules they have put 0 1 and all that so using those uh, code the system recognizes and puts that customer into active list so so how do we interact that agile integration is very important it should be api first it should be cloud native because you don't want it to uh, be very become proprietary you want it to run anywhere it should be low code so if you have to do some on premise low coding it should be very low and i explained yaml where you can do some kind of processes automation processes at a very very low code level uh then of course event driven streaming so if you you are getting some event to do, do and you want to update the other portion of database you don't want to wait for the etl or some enterprise service bus the data should get streamed and update the master database immediately uh, uh data streaming is kafka which i mentioned in the chat and then it should support multi cloud so all this integration should support multi cloud it should not depend on one particular private cloud or data center or one particular public cloud it should manage all the clouds and should work with all the clouds next slide please so typically when we are saying that we want to do ai projects in a enterprise what are we talking traditionally a enterprise would have a erp system they would have some kind of a crm system they would have a website all these things would be typically facing uh, at back end their internal users or their fr their front end users from a from the website all these users typically use browser as the interface and would access the system using interface this is what has been happening with most of the applications nowadays some of the extremely old applications more than 15 year old application there might be even some front end program at times so every desktop which wishes to access the application should download some program and through that program they could access the application typically very powerful uh, pow pow popular front end applications at one point were vb or you had oracle power builder or you had uh, oracle d2k you had these kind of front end programs which would actually get installed into the client and you would access the server from that client nobody does that now because it creates a dependency so once you are saying that you need a particular software then you are not cloud native so even if your entire cloud is cloud native if you have a application which is required to access the data then your system is not cloud native the idea is that you should build as much authentication mechanism and check as possible at the server itself so the person can access the application from a browser that is how the web services architecture is divided decided but now when you have at other side may not be a human being but sometimes even a uh even a uh, uh, api other machine which is accessing you want to be very sure that uh, it uh, that is a scope of work if you are a it person you might get a job not of only uh, designing for a website 
but you may get a job of designing for other servers api i am going now very fast the old monolithic architecture you may have to convert it into microservices the development processes which you are bought for earlier now will become agile or or devops based where you say continuous improvement continuous development ci cd and then uh, you would have a situation where your deployment from vm or a physical container would move to con uh, vm or a physical server would move to a container and your infrastructure which is in house infrastructure would move to a cloud or to a third party data center next slide please uh what i will do is i will uh, i will take control of my screen now because otherwise it is it it, it may be taking time we have just 15, uh, 13 minutes left and i have few slides to complete so i am just trying to share my screen uh is my screen visible now yes sir okay so uh, uh, i am just showing it very fast now i will have to go slightly fast i'm sorry i took too much time uh, these are all the all the buzzwords which we keep on talking in cloud and and this you will keep on hearing your students will get this kind of a jobs like you know node js front end development once you do development on node js you don't need a very fat app server you would typically use uh, use directly work on the web server itself or you need some kind of a a small app server to run your system uh, now i'm going quickly through how do you start a ai ml journey in a, in a company so how do you create a production ready ai ai ml setup so typically what happens is the business leadership has to set the goals i i explained the importance of stakeholders and uh, importance of the uh, of 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 the sponsors who are paying for the project they should decide the goals there is a data engineer job who would gather the data and prepare the data there is a data scientist role which would create a model now try to understand a data engineer and a data scientist are are not really programmer roles a data engineer is somebody who knows how to create collect data from where a data scientist is essentially a statistician with some it knowledge then it goes to a application developer most of the time the application developer is a software company outside the enterprise but sometimes it might be even within your enterprise and then while all this is happening there is a it operation person either it is a contractor outside your office but for ai ml uh, increasingly companies keep in in house people because they don't want a new system to be exposed to their contractors this is how the ai ml system work what is the architecture of this conceptual ml ai ml uh, so typically uh, you have lot of this ml software tools uh, there are there is a jupyter notebook there are python programs there is tensor flow microsoft has got uh, its own system which is which is known as uh, uh, luis so you have got lot of such systems used for ai ml and uh, i'm just stopping the video because my net is becoming unstable so which could be used on top of a, top any time kind of infrastructure so i am having any kind of infrastructure whether it is physical virtual private cloud public cloud hybrid cloud edge internet whatever on those infrastructure sometimes you may have some part of compute acceleration so gpus are typically nvidia graphical processor units you also have uh, fpga fpga is essentially a very specialized hardware called field programmable gate array it is a integrated circuit which works very very fast and tpu is actually tensor processing unit so google has created a tpu which is which is a hardware meant for tensor flow but increasingly i have seen people using gpus itself so if you want some acceleration of analytics for ai you you would use nvidia processors and create some kind of very fast computing layer there you would have some kind of a hybrid multi cloud for people to self service themselves and access your system and then you would have some databases for uh, ml typically the databases are very very huge so you would have large uh, database with large number of columns uh, to manage the data you would have things like data lake where where which is like a data warehouse but where the data is available for everybody nowadays there is a system which is known as data river is being uh, introduced 
where people are trying to make the data lake change very fast. So there are a lot of nomenclatures come every day, but this is the conceptual uh, machine learning architecture. Then we have got uh, how do what are the execution challenges many times in AI ML. Many times AI ML people get uh, very impressed by the Jing Bang demos. The demos are made under certain conditions. Uh, they feel that this can be used in the enterprise. Many times they are being used without the ROI being very clear. So they are not sure about the ROI. I have seen a lot of HR applications which uh, test the user using his video resume. So on the basis of video resumes, you are deciding whether to shortlist a client or not. Many times these models have got a lot of biases that how does a person speak, how does a person act. Uh, and if the programmer speaks English in a particular way, he would design the, the program also to uh, uh, so speaking English in a particular way would be okay. Vis-a-vis -vis speaking in the English in some other way will not be okay. And it would create its own model on the basis of words being used. And, and it would, I mean, it would be sort of a vanity project after some time. So ROI being unclear is one big challenge. You don't know what you want to achieve. Talent shortage is of course there. I mean, again, again, I'm mentioning it. Sometimes it becomes a siloed project. So it becomes a project which somebody takes interest and it becomes sort of shadow IT or that person tries to run it. Uh, it doesn't become broad based uh, because startups are executing, startups are ready to sell their technology at a very low cost. So some executive signs two, three lakhs for a project and it becomes a siloed project and does not get adoption. Uh, there, is, there is lack of data to train a system. So a lot of companies don't have enough data. Uh, the, the company which is selling an AI based system thinks that whatever system they are using is good enough to uh, check the data and they just go ahead and sell the system. Without data, the system is useless. It won't run. It would at best run like an analytics system, which can be programmed very easily. And then, of course, there is infrastructure unavailable. You don't have enough infrastructure and that creates challenge in a AI ML uh, kind of a industry. Why containers and Kubernetes? So Google, I, I was mentioning Google TensorFlow. Now I'm introducing what is known as a Google Kubernetes. So Google has got this system, which is known as container orchestration. If you have so many small, small programs running in parallel on containers, you want some robust system to orchestrate the container. That orchestration engine is by Google called Kubernetes. I, have, uh, I and most of the people in the industry have sort of recommending it very, very heavily. Google manages its own large data centers using Kubernetes. So Google has got big, bigger data centers than anybody else. They are all orchestrated by using Kubernetes. So why not uh, enterprises also get benefit out of Kubernetes? Uh, and, and then of course, they uh, when you are using containers, it becomes very agile. You can fire more containers fast. They work on any OS. They become very flexible on what kind of environments they will run. And they are very scaling, scalable. So you whatever part of the application which, which there is a choke, you can scale that application very, very rapidly. At the same time, whatever are challenges, so sometimes there are challenges with uh, limited options for the ALML ecosystem because uh, the ML system is created by smaller companies who may not have a view of the larger market or a larger customer base. There is a there is an increasing dependency. Uh, they don't follow the 12 factors, especially the six factor, and they create a dependency for their software. If the dependency uh, collapses, that companies get acquired by somebody else, then the system doesn't work at all. Uh, then it is increasingly customers find it very complex. So to upgrade it or to maintain it, it becomes very complex. Again, I'm telling you that if, if people follow the 12 factors, the system will not have lock-in. The system will not have complexity because it would not have external dependency. So it would run till the time the program is running. Mostly it is made in open source. So you could read the code if there is any bug and fix the code. It won't be complex because once you follow the cloud native approach with 12 factors, it just can't become complex. And then it can become inflexible as well because Typically, whatever proprietary solutions you make, once they are in open source and they follow the 12 factors, they can't be. So the approach is the same thing. Uh, go for open source so it is not lock-in. You simplify it as much as possible. And I said one way to simplify is use open source, use 12 factors. Make the infrastructure flexible. So use things like public cloud or make cloud busting where the physical infrastructure can burst its load into public cloud. And then, of course, you get benefit from the massive scale of public cloud. Uh, data is a critical business asset. So data is very, very important for your business and uh, treat that data very, very important. Take care of it. 
uh, I have not taken through you with the database systems, but the, those database systems are extremely important for training your, your system and uh, making sure that the system runs. Uh, our company doesn't sell database system because because we are we are we are we are sort of uh, our all all these database system are our customers and we don't want to compete with them. So so we don't make database system, but but we have tested our system with everybody. So you can take as per your business case whatever you want and and use with those data systems. I'll be sharing these slides with you so you can read the slides. Uh, existing use cases and for all these use cases we have got more than uh, one uh, one reference site so large reference sites are available for healthcare companies for pharma companies for molecular companies for telcos all the two three telcos in india are, are our customers for ai ml uh, we have four insurance companies we have got a lot of banks then we have got a couple of connected car projects so there are a lot of projects where uh, our technology is being used and there's no more just a project being used in small unit but large scale companies have started using AI ML using our technology, and we are very confident of making it run on, on our, our system. Uh, so when you are looking at production system, then what you should be doing, and, and this, is, this is very standard, uh, you have to make sure all the stakeholders are, uh, there is a buy-in. You should collect whatever data is required. You should prepare the models as per your goals and as, not as far as the vanity of the developer. Uh, whenever you're developing a model or an algorithm, you just understand what is your goal and prepare as for that. Don't try to prepare something for the heck of it because you wanted to create some very fantastic or, or very complex kind of system. Make as what you want. Keep Remain humble. Prepare as far as the requirement and you will be very good. Uh, also, keep on monitoring uh, your AI. That's why that AI ops comes into picture. So AI operation team should monitor the models to check whether they are accurate or not. Uh, again, the deployment challenges are the same. I have just listed it here. There is a talent shortage. There is there is uh, not enough data. Teams are very disparate, so they don't want to adjust to AI ML. There is a fear about AI ML, what they will do to IT jobs. So a lot of operation people are actually scared that they may replace some of the operation people because of automation and things like that. So so these things have to be handled. Uh, what is a what is a adaptable AI ML architecture? So essentially, this architecture will ensure that all your teams which are involved in AI ML, which may not be IT people, work together. You should have very clear uh, data pipelines. So you should have clean data. You should not have a data which is unclean. And discussing what is clean and unclean data in, can be another lecture topic. Uh, how data gets corrupted, that can be another lecture topic. But ensure that it is very clean. The cloud platform should give all across people resources so they can work rapidly. So most of the tools required by these people, whether it is Elastic Cache, whether it is uh, whether it is uh, some kind of data streaming between various platforms, uh, you should automate it and make it available to everybody. And then of course you should have enough compute storage and network accelerator so that your function get tested very fast. Non-IT people should not get worried by your system and should not get repeat, uh, repaired by your slow system. So you need a very fast system, which will help you, which will encourage even non-IT people to work on your system with their limited knowledge. Uh, I'm, I'm just skipping this slide because we don't have time. I had sort of, if time was there, I could have gone into details, into containers, into container orchestration. But I think I've covered it a large amount of time. We are already times up with us. So, so I will sort of skip this slide. And, and if there are questions, I'll take them. So uh, summaries, of course, that government and industries are investing into AI. We discuss things like Brookings report. We discuss things like World Economic Forum. All are pointing towards AI. It will give a strategic advantage to economy and nations. I quoted Putin where he said that what will happen. Uh, I quoted a Brookings report where he said that anybody who is successful in AI now will rule the world for next 70 years. And I gave an explanation of steam engine and how steam engine actually made England such a powerful country in spite of the fact that it was very small. Uh, how uh, AI ML is becoming mainstreaming, I, I explained a lot of uh, case studies. I took a lot of names. I, I also explained during COVID times how small companies and how old companies are coming with AI ML models. Uh, I also explained what jobs are available where I showed some advertisements and I said that AI ML programmer jobs are there, but there is also requirement for security, 
for people who find out fraud, for customer service and so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, it would be good idea of, of following uh, model architecture like DevOps, microservices and containerization, apart from learning pure play AI and able to be successful in your job. And that should be told to your students because, because the innovation in AI ML will keep on happening every month, every quarter, you will get more innovative programs. But unless you don't understand the overall IT, your employability will be at question because you may create one great program now. After some time, another person will create a great program. So, so companies tend to check your programming skills, your architecture skill, and not really your, your coding skills at an entry level. They want to, not your AI ML coding skills, your general coding skill, of course, they will check. There is lack of uh, talent, but there's also lack of data to train the model which you create. So there is lack on both sides, on, on manpower, which would create some kind of AI ML systems. But there's also lack of data to train those AI ML models which are created. With this, I'm stopping. My Twitter handle is there. My, power, my, my PDF slide is with the organizers. I will also share that on, on, the, on the slide share and I'll give the link to organizers. So they did not really give you big attachment. They could just send one link and you could download the presentation from there. With this, I am stopping. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time. Do we have time for question answers? Over to you, madam. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, participants, I request all, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask now. Please raise your hand if you've got any questions. I think it is very end of the day, last day of the session. Most of them are tired by now. I will stop the screen sharing so yeah. I can check the... So any questions you have uh, and... Uh, and uh, anything else, please uh, feel to ask. Otherwise, uh, you could tweet to me and I'll be very happy to answer. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the questions, uh, no question is uh, uh, difficult or easy, right or wrong. Anything you have in mind, you could ask. Anything related to what kind of jobs your students are getting, where you should upgrade your skills, what online process to learn. Any, any question you could ask me and I'll be very happy to answer. Okay, so I guess uh, there are no questions. Uh, I'll, I'll now call upon Shalini Sina, ma'am, for the next part. Shalini, ma'am? Uh, you can unmute. Yeah, yes, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandhya. Thank you, Mr. Ajit Joshi. I don't, I think your session was so good that people didn't need to ask any questions. I can see all the, in the chat box, people are saying very informative session. Thank you, sir. They're all thanking you. So you can rest assured that you were a very good teacher for this session. So very good evening to each one of you over here. We have come today to the end of our six day faculty development program. And I hope it was enjoyable as well as knowledgeable for all of you. I have the pleasant task of thanking everyone who helped us in conducting this webinar. Let me first begin by thanking the Provost of the HSNC University, Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani. Dr. Hiranandani heads a new university made of very old and established colleges like HR College, KC College, and Bombay Teachers Training College. With his vision, commitment, and dynamism, he will take this university to become one of the topmost universities of our country. I thank Dr. Hiranandani for always being there for us and for egging us on to conduct better and better programs. The principal of KC College, Dr. Hemrata Bagla, 
is a hard taskmaster, first on herself and then on others. She is forever planning and performing and setting an example to us. I'm grateful to her on behalf of the entire departments of information technology and computer science of Casey College for lending us her unstinting support and guidance. I sincerely thank the University Department of Information Technology of the University of Mumbai, headed by Dr. Varamangai, for immediately coming on board with us and for providing a very fruitful collaboration. Dr. Mangai has helped us at every step of the way to make it a very smooth webinar. I also thank Ms. Shraddha from UDIT for collaborating with us so well and focusing on making this webinar a success. My immense gratitude goes to all our resource persons, Mr. Hiren Dan, Mr. Harish Chandar, Ms. Asha Bharambe, and Mr. Ajit Joshi. Each one of you shared your knowledge with us in a very insightful and interactive manner, and you were the life and soul of this webinar. Thank you. I have now come to that part where I have to express my grateful thanks to the organizers of the six day webinar, especially to the departments of computer science led by DBT START scheme co coordinator, Ms. Geeta Brichwani, and the department of Info information technology led by the head and DBT STAR scheme coordinator, Dr. Rakhi Gupta. I merely sowed the seed of holding such a webinar in Dr. Rakhi Gupta's mind, but it was she who took it forward, planned, collaborated, distributed duties, and helped organize this FTP. Thank you so much, Dr. Rakhi Gupta, for your initiative and execution of that initiative. Ms. Geeta Brijwani, Ms. Pragati Thawani, Ms. Shalini Mahesh Gauri, Ms. Neha Patel, Mr. Narendra Maurya, Ms. Sandhya Bhavsar, Ms. Bina Karutharan, and Ms. Nashra Gavarikar. Thank you, each one of you. This webinar just could not have been possible without all your support and contribution. You all deserve a huge round of applause for working so hard before the webinar and during it, always making sure that everything was in place. I also thank our support team of Mr. Roshan Kilnani and Mr. Monish for looking after all our technical requirements. And I have to thank each one of you participants for your efforts and for your presence at this FDP. You could have planned perfectly, but this FDP becomes a success only because of its audience. We have had participants, not just from Maharashtra, but from Tamil Nadu, from Andhra Pradesh, from West Bengal, Delhi, etc., which is what makes it an all India FDP. We have even had participants from Kuwait and Dubai, which actually makes our FDP beyond all India level and catapults it to international. I also must thank all our students who have been learning on YouTube channel for their presence and interest. Thank you so much, each one of you. May all we have learned benefit us and our students. Thank you and have a great weekend. I think we can end the meeting.